11 o'clock on your Tuesday morning. Welcome in. It is the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs. Tyler Head, West Metro, and Chris Clark along with you here on this Tuesday morning. And, well, you heard the little ID there to open up the hour. Maybe we need to go in and take that one out of the system given the news of yesterday. But, yes, Michi Johnson is in This is Michi Johnson, Ohio State yeah. University. <laughs> and we, we, uh, You're listening to 107.5. This is the game. We probably need to take that one out of the rotation, hindsight being 2020. But uh, just finding out the news yesterday afternoon, Michi Johnson deciding to transfer out of South Carolina's basketball program for his final year of eligibility. A lot of indication that he is going to Ohio State. Nothing official as of yet, but um, no two ways about it. This is a big loss for South Carolina basketball. Yeah, and I, I think, I mean, you, <laughs> how, how many more reminders do we all need that this is a, a different – landscape i guess is the best way to say it than than it used to be and so typically i i do even feel like i i wonder what the numbers say on if a guy transferred into your program the uh chances percentage wise that they'll transfer again as well if, if it's not like a one-year deal and so with michi he obviously was at south carolina for two years now he's entering the portal and um you know, you, you would assume that he is headed to Ohio State. That, that seems to be the indications there. And, you know, I, I I think, allegedly, I think this is probably NIL-focused, is this decision. and Not alleged. Well, you know, you got to just say that word. It's a protecting word. Um, you've got, you've got the, the Ohio State collective, like, tweeting about well, yeah they're, they're already and, quote <laughs> tweeting and, and the way the rules are structured yeah. right now like i, yeah, I saw some nothing I, against it it's not no, like i saw problem. some people yeah. like oh there's tampering like yeah. actually no yeah that that totally doesn't fine. exist right they, now they could have come and sat behind they could have brought their entire sat representation behind the <laughs> sat behind the bench in the first round game and been like hi we're here like help oh, their signs man. up come play for us no problem there, that's certainly a big element of it. And, you know, we know Ohio State's NIL from a football standpoint has definitely stepped up. And I imagine they have a pretty solid one, um, you know, up there for basketball as well. I think there's also the, you know, that's where he's from element that plays into it too. He obviously started his career there, but you know, this past week playing out there in Pittsburgh, a lot of friends and family got to see him play in person for the first time in a while. So I think there's an element of maybe wanting to be back in front of some family and friends in addition to the NIL um, possibly being there as well. So, so it's not just one thing. It's a, it's a litany of factors uh, that I imagine go into why I meet you Johnson again, not officially going back to Ohio state, but certainly seems to be the, uh, the indication as of right now. Yeah. I think it's one big factor, though, um, you know, frankly. And so for him, and, you know, I think it's, it's been interesting looking at the reactions on the Internet. I mean, I think fans have actually started to adjust their expectations. Like, the the difference in the reaction here versus when Juice Wells left, because this kind of reminds me a little bit of that, is, yeah, there, there are people ticked off. But n really, it's almost just like, well, yeah, that's – that's the portal. Uh, it giveth, yeah, it taketh. Yeah. And, you know, if you're South Carolina, you're like, well, all right, there's how many kids are in the portal now? Y you're just you're going out and, and looking to replace them. Hey, there's another scholarship. And y you almost have to look at your team's roster as being year to year because that's what it is right now. And, you know, from, from a roster building standpoint, you kind of know what, what your NIL support is at this point and you kind of have to build it like a like a pro team and that you're you're not going to you're not going to allocate too many resources towards one guy I, I think right. yeah. and so regardless of how you and the rules change every day I feel like regardless of how you have to step around that or um you know it's easier and easier for that to just be the literal sense right now is that you're just building a roster based on a certain salary cap almost yeah. and, and so that that's where we are right now and you know south carolina will go out i was reading there, there's another guy who uh, jamie shaw was writing about today that is looking at visiting south carolina out of the portal top 30 guy in the transfer portal and so this roster this past year was built um primarily out of the portal combined with uh you know a couple of pretty local guys and obviously this coming year's roster will, will probably be built very much the same.
Yeah, you, you would expect that. I mean, two freshmen from the 2024 class in, in Trent, Noah, Oku, Federico, but then you also have the defections, the very meaningful defections, right? Not, not Michi Johnson is obviously one, but you got some guys that you know you were going to lose too. I mean, notably Talon Cooper and BJ Mack, who are both very impactful players. And also, I think it's important to point out very unique players. Like BJ Mack, very unique player, post guy who's kind of a more of a not not an above the rim player, but can guard down low. He can play down low and then he can step out and shoot, right? That makes it tougher to defend Talon Cooper with his size, the way that he administered the offense kind of precisely how Lamont Paris wanted it administered. Those guys are going to be tough to replace. And Michi, I mean, every week we talked in here about his ability to be explosive and in any game you wouldn't be shocked if he goes off for <clears throat> 25 30 points but i think to your point Wes, you know yes the rules up to up to this point the nil rules have been changing daily right now we actually have a better sense in that there really aren't any you know i mean yeah the, the ncaa has been stripped of basically any power and that's why i mean we're joking about somebody being able to sit behind a team's bench and say hey come play for us but literally it's funny because it's true th- yeah i mean basically yeah and and so now as a fan, you know that it's also, you know, you have a better sense of what can be done, but it's also tough because, you know, if Michi Johnson, let, let's pretend that South Carolina is a pro team. If this was Michi Johnson's last year, if he had come to South Carolina on a, on a two year deal as a free agent, you'd be like, Hey, we, we might lose Michi after this season. Mm-hmm. Now, you have to think about it every season. You have to, from a football perspective, you have to think about, okay, cool, I, I feel like we've got our roster for the spring, but they can leave after the spring too if they want. Or, hey, we might add some guys after the spring. So it's just really difficult to wrap your head around, you know, what is the roster going to look like? I think this is where you have to put your faith in Lamont Paris, who, again, just got his extension a couple weeks ago and and got a bump up in salary for he's going to be here for uh, the foreseeable future. And hopefully he's going to have the sustained success that we saw glimpses of, you know, this past season, obviously. And this is where, you know, say, okay, well, you did it this past season, went out and brought in a lot of better looking guys in the transfer portal to to bolster your roster and make it what you wanted it to be for year two in SEC play. And yes, you're going to have theoretically Colin Murray Bowles coming back and hopefully you're hanging on to guys like Studi and, and Jacoby Wright and Zachary Davis as well. But um, you're still going to have to go out there and fill some areas of need in the transfer portal and, and bring in some guys to help out. And this is where you say, okay, Lamont, go out there and do it again. Yeah, and I, I think so couple things here in in basket i feel like the portal and and just transfers in general had already hit the game of men's basketball harder than it it did football and and we kind of like i think we're i feel like we're just more conditioned for transfers in basketball in general now it's taken to a completely different level here recently the last couple years but and, and i also think you talk about fans and getting used to players and, and kind of, well, a guy's not going to be there three or four years anymore. Well, I do wonder in basketball, you're getting, I mean, South Carolina was 26 and eight this year. So you're getting to see 30, even if a guy's there for one year, you're watching that guy and pulling for that guy for 34 games in a season. Whereas football, you're talking about 12 and possibly a bowl, you know? So I, I do wonder, I think fans do still get, that attachment feeling to watching a player, even if they're just there for one year. Now it it certainly helps. And you know, what, what, what's the difference in, let's say five years from now, 10 years from now, when Talon Cooper has a family and he wants to come back to his alma mater and take them to a football game and, and be shown on the sideline and stuff like that. As much as, NIL and and I, I'm not sitting there saying if I was 22 years old I'd I'm not saying I wouldn't be chasing the money either like that, that's a that's a hard seat to envision you being in but th- there is something that is lost when you know it, it's what so Talon was here for one year Michi was here for two but because Talon's final year of eligibility was spent at South Carolina is he remembered differently now when people look back? And so Talon is going to be welcomed 
at CLA, welcomed at williams Bryce Stadium when he comes back and brings his family back years from now. Whereas with Michi, yeah, I mean, I don't, and I don't really think there's that much bad blood this time. Like, I, I, I do right. think there was a little bit more of just a, well, that, that's business Hat at this tip, point. Yeah. You know, yeah. thank you for what you did. But, it, you know, is, is, is Michi going to be coming back to South Carolina on, you know, when they have a former players weekend or something. I, I don't know. I, I think it is a little bit different. And I, I think that matters. And, and I think it's all situational. And I look at something like the Jalen Hurts situation. That's obviously football. So it's a little bit different, but where he played a vital part at Alabama for several years, ends up getting, you know, beaten out by Tua as the starting quarterback and decides to go to Oklahoma. He would be welcomed back with open arms at Alabama as well as Oklahoma. But so they're still a, trying to claim him too. And I they're think, still in trying the NFL. to claim him too. Absolutely. So it's a little bit different situation there, but but it, it's case by case, just depending on what each guy's situation is. And and the people of Ohio State obviously going to welcome him back with open arms. Is he going to be the guy at Ohio State? We don't know necessarily. They got a lot of you know parts and pieces to move around this off season with um you know moving on from their head coach and. Uh, moving their uh, their interim or their assistant coach into the full the head coaching role, um, you know, going forward. So, um, you know, we'll kind of see what Michi Johnson's career is going forward at Ohio State. But he obviously left there as being kind of a bench guy, not really being a featured part of their offense, and returns as being, you know, going to be one of the starting five. Maybe theoretically, maybe. Um, you know, they, they got a new coach, and I I think there are, for lack of a better way to say it, there are probably some political. Not literally political, but what I mean is, for those who don't know, Michi Johnson comes from a very influential basketball family in that area. And, um, you know, coaches in his family, there's a five-star cousin coming up in a couple of years. And I I do think if I was a new coach at Ohio State and I was trying to um, sort of gain popularity within the various basketball communities up there, making sure to bring back Michi Johnson would probably be a valuable idea off the court as well and 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 then kind of carrying over onto the court and that is going to help you in recruiting in those communities moving forward as well. So I wonder if that's not a factor in this too. And, you know, I also think, and this is not a spin job, but from South Carolina's perspective, we've seen they, they were at their best when – they were getting contributions from everybody on the floor. When they were spreading the basketball around, I don't think this is ever going to be a Lamont Paris team that is built around one guy. It's not going to be, you know, for one, you're South Carolina, you're not going to go out and get necessarily a top 10 five-star player. We, You know, they obviously got GG, but most years you're not going to go out and beat out Duke, UNC, whoever for a top 10 guy in the nation. It's going to be built around spreading the ball around, having a lot of guys who can shoot from the outside, playing team defense, and it's never going to be focused on any one guy. Believe it or not, in South Carolina's SEC games this year, they actually had a better record when Michi Johnson scored less than 10 points than when he scored in double figures. They were 8-2, and two, according to my math here, when he scored less than 10 points. They were six and four when he scored more than ten points. Stat so, of the day. Yeah. So if if we look at the way this team is going to be built, it's always going to be about can you put five guys on the floor that can can make the opponent have to defend them. They're going to work the ball around, and they, they've got some guys to replace. None bigger in my opinion, in my opinion, than Talon Cooper. Because he was the straw that stirred the drink. I have a hard group. time deciding if Mac or Cooper is the bigger loss. Because I, I want to say Cooper, but I go back to how unique of a player Mac is and how teams had to defend South Carolina because he could step out and hit. Th- when Mac was hitting, th- there's got to be a stat on Mac hitting threes in games. Let me throw this at you, though. Okay. If, let, let's, say, let's say they replace Cooper well, like a, a similar player, but not Mac, or they replace um, Mac, but not Cooper. We'll continue this conversation on the other side. Gamecock Central Takeover Hour here on the game.
presenting sponsor here every day on the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour here on the game. It's our friends at Firehouse Subs. 14 different locations all across the Midlands. And a big shout-out to our guy, Larry Chandler. Guys, there are there's a new addition forthcoming that we can't tell you about just yet, I don't think, although it is on the website now. Yeah, just tell them. I don't know if I can tell them. I mean, I really don't. But if you go to firehousesubs.com, that's actually a better tease. That's a better way to do it. Firehousesubs.com or the Firehouse Subs app. You can learn about the new limited time offering from Firehouse Subs. The chicken parmesan meatball sub was outstanding. This one I think is going to be as good or maybe even better, guys. Firehousesubs.com or the Firehouse Subs app. You can go earn yourself some rewards on future purchases when you order through there. You can also avoid the wait. Order online with the Rapid Rescue to go. Again, that's firehousesubs.com or the Firehouse Subs app. Welcome back in Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs, Tyler Head, Wes Mitchell, and Chris Clark along with you reacting to the news of Misha Johnson entering the transfer portal last night um, and theoretically going back to Ohio State. No official confirmation on that, but a lot of rumors indicating that will end up being the case. I do give Misha Johnson credit for he went on Instagram Live 
for a couple minutes, kind of addressed it head on. I mean, we don't typically hear from guys when they go in the transfer portal. I mean, they don't owe us a press conference. It's typically just the notes app on their iPhone and a screenshot <laughs> saying, respect my decision and all that kind of stuff. So at least Michi Johnson, you know, talked about it and, you know, did say, hey, you know, I you're not going to understand it completely from my perspective. And he said he had not talked to anybody yet. You can choose to believe that or not. Um, again, it's not illegal for these schools and or these collectives that, excuse me, to reach out to these, play, to these uh, players now before going into the transfer portal. There's no tampering. Um, so uh, if that conversation happened, there would be nothing against it. Yeah. I mean, you're right. He did address it. And I mean, he he left some some great memories, I think, for South Carolina fans at South Carolina, and he he stuck he stuck it out after the first season, and and you know created some awesome things this past year. I I think most Gamecock fans, though, were as as you kind of look at this roster going into this last season, you're like, well, this might be Michi's last year because he obviously wants to make his play at the NBA. Well, I, I don't think anybody necessarily thought what well, might be portaling time but so that that's a little bit different i think in how people process that news but yeah it, it is like we said this is today's game until there is in my opinion until there's revenue sharing tied to contracts tied to hey you're going to be there two years you're going to be there three years th- this is a real reality and you just kind of have to deal with it and while michi johnson did have his streaks and and wasn't you know, always dropping 20 points every single night. He has ups and downs, but I think it's important to look back on the piece that he played in building what this team has become in two years under Lamont Paris. He was one of the first guys to buy in, to transfer in for Lamont Paris's first year and went through the the rough stretch that was year number one and obviously ended up being a, a big part. Uh, he was the second leading scorer a season ago, ended up being leading scorer this year, but, but was a vital part of building what Paris has been able to do through two years and it's unfortunate he's not going to be back for year number three but um, you know you can't uh, 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 undersell what he's meant to this team for the two years that he's been here yeah and now they got to go out and uh, you know hit the portal and and find a replacement and they will and we'll see if it is uh, better the same or worse but I think you know I I remember sitting in that studio over there recording one of our Garnet Trust interviews with him and he made one of the most passionate pleas for big time recruits to give Lamont Paris a chance and to to play for Lamont Paris you know as I've ever heard and so uh, this does go to show you again that it it is a business it is um, at at times guys have to look at it like a business decision and we don't have to enjoy that we don't have to like it but that is a fact of, of where it is and there will be probably three or four guys who have maybe ticked off some other fan base that have hit the portal and will be making the South Carolina fan base happy by joining the program soon. So we'll we'll see what all that looks like. But I wanted to go back to Chris's question. Mm -hmm. So here's how I I would frame that up, like I said. If – which team is better off if they have a direct replacement for B.J. Mack but they don't have a Talon Cooper – or they have a direct replacement for Talon Cooper but don't have a B.J. Mack. If I look at it from that standpoint, as unique as B.J. Mack is and was for South Carolina, the fact that you need your Talon Cooper and your Talon Cooper replacement to handle the basketball on just about every possession, to me, makes him more important. No, and, and I can buy that for sure. Um there's a fair argument to be made there. And and I think, you know, if we sat here and talked about it long enough, you could I, I'm not super convicted of, of that that Mac is like I hate saying like quote unquote most important. What I mean is you know, you're thinking about terms in terms of like hardest to replace and there were many, many games this year where you're sitting there watching, you're going, Man, Talon Cooper can just do so much because he, he was a good defender. He could defend multiple positions, he could shoot right, from outside. He made some huge shots. He had played. That's what we're talking about, Wes, uh, during the break. Like, when Talon Cooper got to South Carolina, he had already played 130 games or something like that. So, that I mean, that is – that's going to be hard to replace. Can you find a 6'4 guard who can shoot, who doesn't really turn the ball over, can administer the offense, guard multiple positions, um, 
you know, play in the post a little bit like we saw him do and has all that experience. And then as a South Carolina guy, you know, to boot, I, and, that's going to be hard. And, and I don't think um, you can also look over the fact that he came from Minnesota, which is a comparable league from a competition mm-hmm. standpoint yeah. to the SEC because we see guys transfer in from all over the place. And when you have a guy that comes up from a mid-major, you always question, okay, can they handle playing it at, at the SEC level? And obviously we saw a guy like B.J. Mack be able to do that without any issue. But a guy like uh, Talon Cooper coming from the Big Ten, there's no concern when you have that kind of type of guy coming in, especially with his level of experience because the Big Ten and the SEC are on even ground when you talk about competition level. The one thing I will say – to give credence to your BJ Mack argument, I like I like guys that that are not scared, and, and I'm not saying anybody else was, but yeah, and, and you know, and, and Michi had an alpha quality to him as well, where he's saying, "Give me the basketball. If we're going down swinging, I'm willing to, I'm willing to be the guy to either be the hero or to take the blame." But I, I thought there were many times this year especially early on when this South Carolina team was finding itself and and maybe internally had a lot of confidence but had not seen it quite come together the way it ultimately did, B.J. Mack is going, give give me the ball down low. I am going to take over, and and I'm going to be a physical presence down down low. Or, guess what? I may have missed four three-pointers, but I'm open. I'm going to shoot. Shooters shoot. I'm not scared. And that's that's the guy that fans, you know, in, in that moment probably roll their eyes at times. Well, he's missed three in a row. Why is he still shooting? Because he's a shooter. <laughs> and so I, I want the guy who's not going to hesitate when the ball dictates that I'm supposed to take that shot, when the scheme dictates that I'm supposed to take that shot, I'm not going to shy away no matter what type of day I've had. And that takes a special type of mindset to be willing to do that, to be willing to take the brunt of the criticism if the if I miss another shot. A lot of people shy away. B.J. Mack, I feel like, never did, and, and I really respect that a lot about him. Yeah, and, you know, I, I kind of think because those guys were so good, like each of those guys that we're discussing here with, with uh, Mack, with Cooper, and, and with Michi Johnson, like they all brought things – to the court that in in a lot of ways i mean it's tough to replace them like can you replace is it going to be easy to replace that alpha mentality that really each of those guys has michi with his explosiveness his ability to kind of go off and have that big game cooper with his steadiness all all the things that we just laid out and then all the things that you just laid out Wes, about mac you know maybe not so if you're lamont paris you got to kind of look at this as you know in what ways can we replace these? You got to maybe take kind of a money ball approach. Like you got to kind of recreate your team in the aggregate because you're not going to find three guys just like that, you know? So in in your replacements, some of those guys, they may not have, like you may not find a big man who can shoot as well as BJ Mack, but can you find one who plays above the rim a little bit more? Maybe. If you're if you can't find a guy who's played a hundred something games and has the size that Cooper does, can you maybe find a guy who, you know, gets to the rim a little bit more or something like that? And that's or maybe has a couple of years of eligibility too. Yeah, a couple of years yeah. of eligibility. Like there's gonna be some trade offs here, but um you kinda know what you're gonna be missing and now you have to figure out what you need to try to go get. Absolutely. We'll dive into some of the uh, what we heard from some of the football players yesterday talking to the media as spring practice rolls on coming up. It's the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs here on the game.
All right, y'all, continue to tell you about our friends at Classic Roofing. Joe Reeder, Max Sawyer, two buddies of mine, they want to give you the best roofing support you can have here in the Columbia, South Carolina area and everywhere around it. Give them a call today, 803-590-7870. Also, you can just head on over to ClassicRoofingSC.com and get more information on their services. And you can also click around there and find a way to set up a free estimate. Uh, They've got a wealth of experience spanning more than 20 years. This team of experts is well-equipped to handle any and all of your roofing requirements. That could be just a small repair on your your home, or it could be a huge commercial undertaking. Really, it could be anything in between those two things. They've got you covered completely. The mission is very simple. Provide you with top-notch roofing solutions to not only protect your property or business, but also enhance its curb appeal. Give them a call today, 803-590-7870. Or again, head on over to ClassicRoofingSC.com. Welcome back in Game Cox Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs, Tyler Head, Wes Mitchell, and Chris Clark along with you. Quick reminder coming up later on this afternoon. Got Gamecock Baseball taking on Presbyterian 631st pitch, 615 pregame show right here on 
the game. We heard from a number of uh, football players yesterday as spring practice rolls on. Uh, practice number four got started about two hours ago. And, of course, we're going to hear from Coach Beamer coming up at 1230. We'll have that for you right here on the game. As always, uh, I want to start off with this. Uh, Josh Simon, the now veteran of the tight end room, returning for his second season here at South Carolina with Trey Knox moving on to the NFL. They, of course, have a new tight ends coach, that being Sean Elliott coming over from from, uh, being the head coach at Georgia State. Josh Simon, cut number 17 here, Ed, uh, gave a little bit of his thoughts on uh, what Coach Elliott's been like so far here at Carolina. I knew that one was coming. I knew that was coming. Uh, coach Elliott, man, if you can understand what, like, they say the old school coaching, like old school guy, you kind of got to look, see who around you with him. He'd be like, Coach Elliott, you can't come on now, you know. But, uh, He's, he's intense. He has high energy every day. He, uh, he loves what he does. He's not going to take mediocrity. You know, that's what kind of what you would look for in a coach. Like, he's going to push you to be your best, and he's going to push everybody. He don't just coach us, the tight ends. He, you, if you see him, he be flying around talking to everybody. But yeah, man. His methods may be a little more unorthodox in today's coaching landscape but there's no uh, no denying that sean elliott is is very intense and very successful with the way that he goes about his coaching and so far seems to resonate with the guys here yeah i have so many thoughts first of all let me make a public plea to jeremy smith i want josh simon again on a <laughs> garnet trust um episode sure love that guy he, he doesn't quite have the the zabo the Leggett um, voice. Yeah, he's about halfway there. It's close. <laughs> he's got his, uh, was it, um, Dalzell, South Dalzell. Carolina? He's got Shout the out. Dalzell Shout accent. Out Shout out. Um, love Josh Simon. That, that guy's going to be quietly a huge part, I think, of what they do this year. And, you know, I, I think Sean Elliott can get away with some things because he is so passionate and it comes from the right place. You know, if you're going to be a fiery yelling, screaming, madman on the field. You, you also have to, to love the guys and, and, and care and, and all those things as well. And, and Sean Elliott certainly does that. And, and I think that's why it does resonate with, with the guys, he, even new guys. And, and I think, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day. They were like, this, this class of, of kids on campus right now, they were, I mean, how old when Sean Elliott was here before? Like, they they – they didn't know what they were in for when he got here. We we all are very familiar with, with Elliot and his coaching style and the passion he has. And so I, I think it, it it means a lot, but it, it really expands out. You can talk about him as tight ends coach, but, Chris, the run game coordinator part of the title, as we've said, is the more intriguing aspect of this and how he's going to kind of put his fingerprints over what South Carolina does I think schematically and just, um, you know, even with some teaching points on what the Carolina run game looks like this year. As as we've talked about, Shane Beamer seems to be just completely focused on finding a way to fix this running game. Yeah, and, and that's why, I mean, you, you bring in Elliott, and, and I think a lot of people, to go back to the, the day that the news came out that he was going to be hired, oh, awesome, Sean Elliott's coming back, tight ends coach. It's kind of weird, right? And so you look back at a couple of things. He has been a tight ends coach before. That's that's correct. He, he actually did it early in his career at App State. He played D-line in college. Mostly has coached O-line. But he has so much experience in the run game, whether that's, you know, when he was a head coach at Georgia State, he had a lot of influence on their run game. And they were pretty good in the run game. You know, they had Darren Granger there who um, – ran the football a lot, was a mobile guy. And so you look at the carryover now, South Carolina, as we've, as we've discussed plenty, their, their entire quarterback room is now more mobile, led by Lenore Sellers, but you've got Doty in the mix. You've got Robbie Ashford. You have mobility in that quarterback room. Um, and then, you know, you look back at his time at South Carolina as a run game coordinator. When he got to South Carolina under Steve Spurrier, he brought in some things that Steve Spurrier, one of the greatest offensive coaches of all time, put into his offense that helped them. And so I think from what we've picked up, West, there's going to be some involvement there on the part of Elliott to, yes, you needed to revamp your roster uh, from a personnel standpoint, 
and they've done that by flipping the running back room. You got to get better up front. But Elliott, with just his knowledge of scheme and his knowledge of the run game, I think this was was much more than just hey, we're we're going to give Sean Elliott a title to get him to come here. Well, and and from a run game standpoint, you can't really get a whole lot worse than what you had you know, a season ago, and you had moments there with Mario Anderson, you know, putting together a couple hundred yard games, but you once again came in at the bottom of the SEC um, for the third year in a row, which is why he moved on from Ontario Hardesty, he brought in Mark Webb Blackwell, now bringing in Sean Elliott as the coordinator of the run game to try and improve, as well as bringing in some really good talent, you know, headlined by Rocket Sanders, but Oscar Attaway, Jordan Howell, guys like that, that, um, you know, are expected to be big contributors in this offense as well. Yeah, I would dare say on paper they're going to be improved in just about every aspect that affects the running game. You have you start out obviously at QB, you have a couple more run-based quarterbacks. You look at the offensive line, I think we certainly think now that they're healthy, a year older, that that's going to be improved. And then maybe just as important as any of that, you've got a, a running back group that is, is much more experienced, uh, You know, has a, a resume of, of being able to go do it, I mean, you're talking last year, obviously, of the carry on joiner having to play the position for the first time since Pee Wee. So I, I think for, for them to be in that spot, um, you can kind of see how they have systematically improved every aspect. You have, like you said, a new coach there as well. And the, the real question is just to, to what extent will it be improved? Like, I think it clearly will be improved. And can you improve enough in the running game? that some of your question marks in the passing game with a new receiving core, a, a young quarterback, all those things to where the the totality of the offense is an overall positive as opposed to just being a situation where we're talking midway through the year, like, hey, the running game's improved, but the passing game has dropped off. So uh, I think that's always the question. Can you, as a whole, show improvement on, on that side of the ball? And so far, from everything I've heard, guys, Offense, as you would expect, bunch of young guys. Offense is so much about timing as well. Defense very much further along as you would expect right now. That's almost always the case at this point in spring camp. But this defense is, I I believe, from everything I've I've heard, kind of showing their experience, particularly with that front group. You know, front six, the linebackers, the defensive line. It, it's very obvious that this group is talented, is experienced, and I think hungry to go out there and improve on some of the things we saw last year. Absolutely. We will uh, have more player audio, let you hear what they have to say, and again, talk about our preview coach Beamer coming up a little bit uh, later on in the day as spring practice rolls along. It's Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs here on the game.
Welcome back in Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs. Tyler Ed West Mitchell and Chris Clark along with you on this Tuesday. Again, coming up at 12.30, going to hear from Coach Beamer as he recaps. So uh, really the first full week of spring practice, or I guess second full week of spring practice, uh, getting rolling with practice number four earlier on today. And here are thoughts on how things are progressing as uh, we get closer and closer to the spring game coming up on April the 20th. Uh, you can, as always, stream his um pressers on youtube and if you wanted to put that on a nice tv and uh, maybe have that outside or somewhere in your home integrated media has got the perfect setup for you yeah inside outside man cave patio back porch where, really wherever you want to put it anywhere that it's possible our guys michael and nathan can help you do it and yeah you can you can have youtube on your tv on any of your devices and if you're like a typical household you probably got multiple devices going at once and so you want to make sure you would you know avoid that that dreaded circle where you're buffering. They can make sure that you don't have any dead spots for internet inside or outside. They can help you source your equipment. You don't have to go to the big box stores. Check out our friends at Integrated Media. You can give them a call, 803-948-8327 or integratedmediainc.com. So as we look ahead to later on this week, um, South Carolina obviously handling the first two opponents in Presbyterian and North Carolina in the first two rounds of the NCAA tournament. Found out last night who their Sweet 16 opponent is going to be, that being Indiana, after they got through uh, and beat Oklahoma last night up there in Assembly Hall as they set their sights going forward. And you and um, Olivia talked about this in the Garnet Trust Hour um, when you recorded it yesterday, and she actu accurately predicted that Indiana was going to be the team that uh, made it into the Ooh. Sweet 16. And um, the last time these two teams played, she was right on it. was her freshman year back in 2019. Indiana actually got the better of a number five South Carolina team. Man, I, I was sweating because we, we ended up talking. Uh, I just kind of followed her cue, and we ended up talking more about Indiana in um, you know, anticipation that this would maybe the, be the game. Oklahoma was game for this matchup. Oh, yeah, like it, was, they, it was a good, it was a good competitive game. They, they have got to be sick to their stomachs. I, I felt like they were in pretty strong position to go win that game. And Indiana, with the home crowd, kind of found a way at the end. But now this sets up South Carolina, the number one overall seed, obviously against four seed Indiana. There'll be about five o'clock ESPN on Friday. Perfect timing for you to get home, get off work, get set up, maybe go somewhere and watch the game, and. You know, for for the most part, y'all, like, there have been some upsets, obviously, but for the most part, you've still got your elite teams basically still alive in this thing. As you get down into your Sweet 16, you'll have um, actually earlier in the day on Friday, Notre Dame, two seed, Oregon State, three seed. They'll be battling it out, and they'll face the winner of South Carolina Indiana. So South Carolina will already know their opponent by the time they play. And, you know, Indiana, good basketball team, y'all. Like, th this will be a good matchup. This should be a fun matchup. But personally, I didn't see a lot from this team to make me think from a matchup standpoint that they're going to, like, give South Carolina fits or anything like that. Mackenzie Holmes is their best player. She's a big. She can score. She can rebound. She, You know, they kind of run their offense through her. Uh, but I, I think this is a game clearly South Carolina will be pretty heavily favored at this point you get down to the final 16 teams you have to play well but based on what we see from South Carolina based on what I saw from Indiana last night I, I watched most of this game uh, I think it, it sets up pretty well for the Gamecocks really if I'm looking ahead there's only a couple of teams that are still in this thing that I think would really potentially at least threaten South Carolina from a matchup standpoint if both teams were to bring their a game who, who are they can't can't do that tease. Well, I can. I I will say <laughs> this. I I don't. Man, West Virginia almost beat Iowa yesterday. Yeah, I think South Carolina would smoke Iowa. Honestly, I hope we get the rematch. I mm -hmm. Iowa may get upset before this. Play Colorado next. Yeah, and I, I but I look Southern Cal with Juju Watkins. She she is a problem. That's the team nobody is talking about in this. That Man, she is dangerous. I, I, to be completely honest, have not like you know their West Coast team. Right, right. Haven't really watched them. Watched a little bit of them last night. I see. I see the hype. Like she is a difference maker, and we have seen South Carolina give up some points to big time scorers. Like that's the one thing if you want to be really nitpicky about this team defensively is that 
some girls have had huge games against them because South Carolina, I feel like, is almost willing to let – like, you can score 30, <laughs> but your team's still going to score, like, 57. You know what I'm saying? Like, they're okay just playing team defense and not putting too much um, emphasis on any one person. But I uh, I think that, that Southern Cal team, you know, te- Texas maybe, but – if South Carolina plays their A game, yeah, sure. they're going to beat anybody. But that's the beauty of sports. You don't always know if you're going to have your A game. Yeah, absolutely. And, again, all four number one seeds still live um, in the women's side of the bracket. And you, know, you mentioned not knowing if Iowa was going to be good enough to get back to the a national championship to match up with South Carolina. They would have to face Southern Cal in the final four yes. if both teams continue to win out. And I, I don't know if they could get past Southern Cal. It's just, you know, outside of Caitlin Clark, they're not a, a great team from top to bottom. Um, but we'll see what continues to happen over the course of these next couple of games. But again, South Carolina and Indiana coming up on Friday in the Sweet 16. Five o'clock, uh, we'll have the specifics of, of which radio station you'll be able to listen to that a little bit later on in the weeks. We do have Gamecock baseball that night taking on Alabama as well. But exciting time as South Carolina continues to pursue another national championship championship we'll continue to break out that matchup down as the week goes along but that'll do it for today's edition of the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs again coming up in a little over 30 minutes time Coach Beamer going to take to the podium and we will uh, hear from him his thoughts on everything that's gone on in spring practice since uh, Wes and Chris were out there last week to observe everything on day number one again halftime show with myself Terry Ford coming up next here from Coach Beamer at 1230 all right here on the game